Love them or hate them, double wall assemblies are without a doubt one of the best ways that you can get a super insulated wall assembly without resorting to things like exterior insulation or spray foam. In this video, we're going to walk through our preferred double wall assembly, show you some of the details and specs, as well as let you in on some of the less often discussed design considerations when you're building a double wall, and why these double wall assemblies require some careful planning in advance. Let's get into it. So why would we build a double wall assembly? Well, you probably have a good idea about why if you've clicked on this video, but double wall assemblies allow us to maximize the amount of insulation that we can fit into our walls, beyond what we can often achieve with exterior rigid insulation, and far beyond what would be possible with SIPs or ICFs. And the best part is that framing out an additional interior 2x4 wall really doesn't cut into the budget very much compared to some other strategies. And so the R value of our walls are really just limited by the distance you space the secondary interior wall away from the primary primary exterior framed wall. Double walls also provide a thermal break between the exterior and interior walls, which can satisfy continuous insulation requirements. It's also one of the few ways that we can achieve passive house levels of thermal resistance relatively easily. Now let's talk about some assembly details and what our preferred double wall assembly looks like. Here we've got a double wall that's been framed using a 2x6 exterior wall and a 2x4 interior wall. Now, you could actually construct both of these walls out of 2x4s, depending of course on the loads imposed on that structural wall, and a lot of people do use a double 2x4 system, but for all intents and purposes, we're using 2x6 framing for those exterior walls. Then we have some plywood sheathing, and we like to use plywood instead of OSB, as plywood is a lot more resistant to moisture since it can dry out much more easily. When plywood gets wet, it increases in permeability from around less than one perm when it's dry to over 10 perms when it's wet, compared to OSB, which barely increases in permeability at around two to three perms, and it has a tendency to stay wetter for longer. It's also composed of a lot less real wood, making it easier to digest and consume for rot fungi and mold. We can also use a gypsum sheathing like dens glass instead of plywood if we want even more moisture resistance and drying potential, and sometimes in those super insulated double wall assemblies, it's necessary to switch to a gypsum sheathing just for that additional moisture safety, as we aren't getting the heat flow necessary for drying. For our water resistive barrier, we're using Blueskin VP100, which is a self-adhering vapor permeable membrane and will provide a monolithic water and air control layer as it's bonded to the sheathing and won't allow water or air to travel freely behind the membrane. This is a really big deal when it comes to these super insulated wall assemblies, as they're a lot more sensitive to moisture and we want to provide as much redundancy as possible to reduce the risk of future failures. Then installed over our WRB, we have vertical furring strips, which are providing a ventilated drain screen behind our cladding, and we really want the benefits of ventilation in addition to drainage in this case, since this will help to dry out those walls if they happen to get wet from condensation or a small leak. Again, super insulated walls like these have significantly less heat flow, and therefore we need to be doing everything that we can to improve durability and resistance to bulk water. You could also use an entangled mesh product instead, or corrugated plastic battens like core event strips, but in this case we're opting for just an off-the-shelf wood furring strip. Now for our insulation, we can use any dense pack blown-in insulation or bat insulation of our choosing. Just keep in mind that we want to fill the cavity space as tightly as possible with this insulation so that there are no gaps, and so using a dense pack insulation like cellulose generally is the preferred insulation material for double walls. Here we have rock wool bats for this demonstration, but generally we prefer dense pack cellulose. Dense pack insulation also helps to prevent convective loops within the wall assembly, whereas insulation bats are a lot less likely to be installed tight enough against each other between each layer. Now, before people start saying that cellulose will catch on fire and support mold, cellulose insulation is treated with borates, and the recycled paper that's used for blown-in cellulose is stripped of a lot of the things that would otherwise provide a food source for mold. You can go and look up some videos of fire tests on dense pack cellulose insulation, and it really does perform exceptionally well. If you're concerned about cellulose, you can of course switch over to fiberglass or mineral wool instead. Now on the interior side of the interior framed wall, we have a taped smart vapor retarder membrane. In this case, Intello Plus, which is our condensation control strategy. This membrane is our interior vapor retarder in the assembly, but it will primarily serve as our interior air barrier. And this is really important to prevent interior air leakage and convective looping in the wall cavity that could result in condensation on the back side of the sheathing. It also provides the benefits of vapor variability, where the membrane increases in vapor permeance if relative humidity exceeds safe levels, and continues to increase in permeance as conditions get wetter. 
Traditional polyethylene vapor barriers trap moisture and do not allow for drying, so we want to avoid using completely impermeable materials in this assembly. We also have to consider that, in many climate zones, we have cold seasons and warm seasons. During the warmer, more humid months, Vapor drive is predominantly from the outside inwards. If we have air conditioning, moisture-laden air will have a high likelihood of condensing on the backside of a traditional vapor barrier since we can't dry through it, and that condensation will support mold growth and rot within the cavity. Again, we want to make sure that the intello membrane is completely airtight by taping all of the seams, joints, and penetrations, and making sure it's sealed to the window units as well for one continuous air control layer. Now, why don't we locate the air barrier membrane, that's the intello layer, at the center of the wall? Isn't that best practice? Well, there's several reasons for this. It's true that ideally you would want the air barrier to be at the center of the double wall assembly, primarily because it's protected, it can throttle vapor, and your interior wall can provide a service cavity. However, let's take a step back and think about the sequencing for a second. If we install our Intello on the interior side of the exterior wall, we need to have the insulator come back twice because we have to insulate that exterior wall before the membrane goes in. And then we have to install the membrane and make it airtight, and then the insulator has to come back and insulate the interior walls. Now, if you've got a crew that's installing bats, this might not be as big of a deal, but if you're installing blown-in dense pack insulation, which is extremely common in double wall systems, the insulator has to come back and fill those interior walls. So it's going to cost more to insulate those walls from a labor perspective, and it's going to take longer. The second reason that we locate the Intello on the interior side is that smart vapor retarder membranes need to be as close to the interior as possible for them to work. Smart vapor retarder membranes are vapor variable. The way that smart vapor retarder membranes work is that they are a low class 2 vapor retarder when relative humidity is below 60%, but as relative humidity increases, the membrane increases in permeance, which is really beneficial because they don't trap moisture within the wall cavity. However, cold air can't hold as much moisture as warm air, and so if we locate the smart vapor retarder membrane closer to the center of the wall, the membrane is going to be colder, and therefore it could allow too much vapor to pass through that wall assembly. Now, this probably matters less if you're in a temperate climate, but it matters a lot if you're in a cold climate. Above all, we want this membrane to be airtight, and that's what matters most. Then we have some 2x3 horizontal strapping, which provides a service cavity for things like electrical conduit and plumbing runs without puncturing the intello membrane, and it will serve as a fastening base for our drywall layer. Now, let's talk about windows. There's a few things that we need to get right when it comes to our window openings, but first, let's start with how we're tying in the exterior framed wall with the interior framed wall. We're joining those framed walls with a piece of 3 quarter inch subflooring that's been ripped to span the gap created by the cavity space, and we're running that ripped 3 quarter inch subfloor around the jams and on the underside of the header, and this will create a really nice uniform substrate to work with as we go to install the other window components. Now, the thickness of the 3 quarter inch subflooring needs to be accounted for when sizing the rough openings. Adding a 3 quarter inch on either side of the framed rough opening reduces the size of the rough opening by 1.5 inches in each direction, and so this needs to be accounted for, otherwise the windows that you order won't fit. Then, we need to make sure that we're sloping the sill towards the exterior to facilitate drainage. In the event that water finds a path underneath the window, whether it was from a poorly installed piece of flashing or an actual window leak. We want to assume water is going to get inside, and therefore we want to drain the sill. We have a whole video on flashing windows, which you can go and watch up here, but you can use a piece of beveled siding or a ripped 2 by piece of lumber, and that will get installed over the rough opening. Then we have some beveled shims installed over the beveled plate to provide a level surface for the window installation, and then we're simply just spacing those at regular intervals to support the window and provide a drainage gap. Finally, we're going to coat the entire rough opening in a fluid applied flashing for a monolithic transition to the WRB. We can also use flashing tapes, however, we like fluid applied flashing systems in this case since they're able to easily conform around different building geometry without having to do much origami with flashing tapes. In this case, we're using Viscon, which is a really versatile product that can be rolled on or brushed on or even sprayed onto a surface to provide a water control layer and an air barrier, and it's designed to be compatible with the Intello system. In terms of windows, we have the option of either using a more typical flanged window, or we can go with a European-style flangeless window. Both can be made to work very well, but a flangeless window is going to give you a lot more freedom where you can locate the window unit within the rough opening. A flanged window is intended to be installed flush with the surface of the WRB and the exterior sheathing. There is some discussion about whether it's better to have windows inset, sometimes referred to as innies, or whether the windows should be installed closer to the exterior. These are called outies. Unless 
the wall assembly is quite thick and you have an extreme temperature gradient between the interior condition space and the exterior environment, it actually doesn't matter too much where you locate the window unit from a thermal perspective if you use good windows that are thermally broken. Focus more on the water management. Inset windows will provide more protection against bulk water entry at the head, however it will increase exposure at the sill, whereas Audi windows are less protected at the head, but more protected at the sill. If we're flashing and draining these components properly, both strategies can work just fine. The window unit should be integrated into the WRB and the flashings, but left open at the sill for drainage. Now, when it comes to air sealing the window, we want to air seal the window on the interior on all four sides. We like to use a combination of low expanding foam or backer rod and air sealing tape. However, you could use any air sealing strategy of your choosing as long as it's continuous and as long as it's integrated into the other air control airs. The backer rod or expanding foam fills in and insulates larger gaps between the rough opening and the window unit, and the tape provides our primary air seal and can bridge different materials without potentially cracking over time. For our air sealing tape, we're using Tescon Vana. I'd recommend using something like Tescon Profil for window corners, but essentially we're using a pressure sensitive acrylic tape that sticks aggressively to a lot of different materials and doesn't lose adhesion over time. Just make sure to apply pressure to activate the adhesive. We also want to make sure that we're taping the smart vapor retarder membrane that was installed on the interior side to the windows so that we have a continuous monolithic air barrier on either side of that wall. Guys, if you found this video helpful, make sure to leave a like and subscribe for more weekly building science videos and head over to our website at asiri-designs.com where we have over 150 free building science articles that cover a wide range of topics. Links will be in the description below. For now, good luck with your projects. Cheers.